one Indian Fide Master defeated two elite Grand Masters in one tournament on the same night. So through this video, you will know what it takes to defeat Karun Okamura and Jubaba Badur. This is a game from the Tidal Tuesday and I'm talking about Fide Master Senthil Maran from India. Let's get started. Hikaru Nakamura was white and he played knight f3 and um, Senthil Maran went with d5 and after e3 knight f6 we get the semi slab position after d4. Here Senthil Maran went with knight bd7. We can call this a semi slab or the Mehran opening. And after queen c2 bishop d6 he played g4. Now this is a line that's called the Shabalov uh, variation or the Shiro variation of the semi slab g4 has been played before. Here black has different options. Black can take the pawn, black can play bishop b4. Taking the pawn would uh, mean that white has rook g1 and the game goes on. But in this position after g4, Senthil Maran played d takes c4 and g5, knight d5, bishop into c4 and now e5. In this position after e5, you can see that uh, there are different options that white could go for. White could play knight e4 to attack this bishop. White could also play bishop d2, just developing another piece. But in this position, Hikaru Nakamura went wrong in the game. If you look at the position, it's all connected with the story. The pawn on g5 is supported by the knight on f3. With the help of the pawn break, black is trying to also divert the attention of this knight. And if you're wondering that uh, the drawback of this move is that the, the knight on d5 feels loose, that is not the case because white cannot capture the pawn. Giving you one second to spot why white cannot capture the d5 pawn. Simple loose pieces drop off. Um, so there's this check and the, the bishop is hanging. So black is winning the piece here. So after e5, knight d5 cd5 bishop cannot capture the pawn and if d takes e5 in this position then there is bishop b4 check and intermezzo and after bishop d2 you can take the bishop and then uh, take the bishop on c4 so in this case after knight d5 cd5 black is already in a great position one thing is if you want to beat elite grandmasters you need to get good position out of the opening so that's point number one and after bishop b3, Senthil Baran played e4. And the, the point is that once the knight moves, g5 pawn is hanging. In this position, Hikaru decided to give up the central pawn with knight e5. And um, Senthil Baran took that with bishop e5, d5, and then got his knight to e5. Thanks to this pawn on e4, knight can sit on f3 or on d3, depending on the situation. So after f4, he played knight d3 check and yeah white's position is already already quite horrible the king has no way to go in case of king d2 there is just bishop f5 followed by rook c8 in case of king d1 already bishop g4 check coming with the tempo and in case of king f1 this is what happened in the game senthil maran played bishop f3 check you see that he is developing piece with tempo so he's not giving any chance for these pieces to come out in the game. After bishop s3 check king g1 even the rook on h1 is locked up. He got his new piece into the game with rook c8 again attacking the queen on d on, on c2. Another point to note is that this queen con should continue to support the bishop on c1. So after queen d1 uh, Sendil Maran could have actually played knight takes f4 and uh, finished off the game here because e4 is made by a deadly check on b6 and also queen g5 is a threat but in the game he played castles which is also sound and very much winning um, in this position Hikaru Nakamura played bishop c2 and then again Sentil Maran found a nice way to wrap up the game he got all these pieces and got the momentum with a rook takes c2 so that's a good part about having a massively winning positions that you have different options to choose from and here after rook to c2 i have a feeling that senthil maran just followed his intuition and went with the rook c2 because after queen c2 he has queen d7 threatening queen g4 also threatening rook c8 and after queen e2 he got his rook to c8 and bishop is just deadlocked there 
and any attempt to come out would mean that the Rukon C8 will go to the seventh rank. And as I said, Santil Baran went with his rook. The rooks love seventh ranks, and that's a heaven, you see. And then after rook d1, he simply followed it up with bishop g4, captured. Uh, he played bishop h3, and then after queen g4, queen g4, bishop g4. The rook is attacked. If the rook moves, then d2 hangs, and eventually this rook also will be lost as it's already bottled up. And after king g2, he picked this, and knight takes b2. D2 is also hanging uh, because the rook has to move, and the d2 falls. So that's game over. And in a few moves, uh, he went on to win the game. That was amazing play by Sentil Maran. Next, we have the game of um, Sentil Maran against Jobaba Badur. So here, Sentil Maran was white and uh, Jobaba Badur was black. And Sentil Maran opened with d4 and after knight f3, knight f6, he, he played g3. And then after bishop f5, he played c4. So this is an approach that uh, is usually used by players who want to avoid the line starting with c4 on the main line. So we do get uh, the g3 uh, slav, which has been employed by many strong grandmasters, including Vizit Gujarati, Anish Kiri, to name a few. And after c4, c6, he played knight c3. And once e6 happens, he collects this bishop with knight h4. All this is theory. And then after bishop e4, f3, First, he attacks the b7 pawn with queen b3 and then plays bishop g2. In order to facilitate the e4 break, white will eventually have to capture on g6. So a sound understanding of the opening you play is very essential. And uh, you also have to have momentum. When you're playing against a player like Jobava or Hikaru, it's, uh, it's clear that you need to be very alert to possible tactical responses from their side and also have a sound understanding of the position. In this game, in this position, Sendil Manan went with a very strong continuation and he realized that this is a moment to go and break. So first he plays cd5 and then follows it up with pawn break e2, e4. Again, this is part of uh, the opening strategy. Sendil Manan understood that this is a key because he has studied and has some experience in these positions and i think that can you know help you in finding the plans or finding better moves after the transition from opening to middle game and after that b6 sentil maran played bishop g5 and you look at this position has completed the development everything is over only these rooks will now occupy some strong and important files and after queen d7 played rook d1 and started with the attack on the queen side now in this position, instead of the king going towards uh, c8, if the king went to g8, let's say, in that case, I think Sentil has e5, and then after knight h7, he has bishop into e7, or he can just drop this bishop back to c1, and then maybe follow it up with some attack of the king's side. In the game after triple zero, he knows the target is the king, so he went with a4, and then played knight to b5. King a8 followed. And uh, here there are two interesting moves. One is uh, rook c1 and another is, um, let's say, something like a5. I think a5 is a possibility as well. But a5 allows knight c4. In this game, after knight b5, king a8, Sentil Maran decided to push this knight away instead of the b6 knight. I was, when I, when I saw the game, I thought a5 is interesting, but e5 is also uh, possible to play. And the point is that if, let's say, knight g8, then he simply has rook c1. If you take the bishop, then there is rook c7. So there are such tactical ideas. But in the game, after e5, Jabawa played knight to e8. And after bishop e7, queen e7, he got his rook to c1. The difference is that this knight on e8 is now covering c7 square. So, so that's probably why Jabawa played knight e8. And then after rook c1, he played knight c4 because he wants to block the range of the rook. But uh, I think it's only temporary. Look at how Sentil Maran plays here. He sees that uh, this knight is trying to block the range of the rook. And he looks at all his pieces. And then he uses the Mechagonov's principle. And I think this is also one concept that you need to master if you have to beat uh, top players. Mechagonov's principle is about improving your worst place piece or optimal utilization of your forces in this position. The bishop on g2 and the rook on f1 have not entered the game yet. So he plays rook f2 and then bishop f1. This is also a, an idea that's uh, very similar to what Rubinstein did in one of his games uh, against the Terrace defense, I think. Rook f2 and bishop f1. 
and then in this position i think black had to go knight a5 and then go back to c6 for example after knight a5 a queen has attacked you go queen c3 and then this was the moment for jobawa to keep things together but after rook f2 he went wrong with a6 and there came knight a3 and the problem is that you cannot follow the same idea that i mentioned let's say knight a5 now black has queen b6 the problem is that after queen b6 let's say the knight is attacked so the knight moves the rook on f2 joins the party with um, uh, that is also not necessary in this position i was considering rook fc2 but just bishop f1 and then idea is bishop a6 so it's already pretty devastating so so this was one variation that i saw but after knight a3 and if you look at this position after rook f2 knight a5 this option of queen b6 is not here because we have a knight on b5 so that was a difference and then after knight takes a3 you see that he's capturing with the b pawn making sure that even this rook joins the forces uh, the rook joins the attack on the b line and then after b8 3 f6 he got his rook to c2 now he is threatening a deadly check on c8 if black tries to prevent with uh, queen d7 then white can further go with queen b6 uh, intending to go rook c7 i think it's a very deadly position if you go fully passive with rook b8 it's not going to help you because white has bishop f1 and if you go on uh, defending let's say the a6 pawn with this the drawback of the last move uh, the queen is now on a4 so rook b8 um, is uh, is a vulnerability so white attacks it that's just one of the possible variations so after f6 rook fc2 jababa badur played f takes e5 sentil played rook c8 check and after rook c8 rook c8 king a7 simply picked up the pawn on e5 now if you look at it uh, if you look at the position and ask yourself what is the threat white is tending to play a5 and uh, queen b6 and it's very hard to stop this threat so jababa played b6 to prevent a5 because he had probably thought of a5 king b7 i think but in this position sentil just played queen c3 threatening queen c6 rook a8 mate again if you compare this game with the game that he played against sikaru there is momentum you know he's building over his advantages and then after queen d7 he played bishop f1 uh, because now this bishop can also contribute with some shots like um, bishop takes a6 if uh, necessary or a5 b5 bishop into b5 if necessary or just bishop b5 you know, you never know what kind of move can happen so after rook h5 he played f4 after d4 he got queen c4 now you see the real use of having your bishop on f1 threatening mate in one with queen a6 and then after knight d6 sendil could have finished the game with queen a6 but he played e6 here and then after queen d6 again threatening rook a8 when he played bishop g2 the game ended in a few moves and um, yeah again here there was a mate in one but sentil played queen f7 this was played uh, with less than 5 seconds for both the players and then eventually he reached a position where there are no good checks for black and jababa badur lost here on time so those were two games that uh, sentil maran won on the same night in the same tournament in dial tuesday defeated hikaru nakamura defeated jababa badur so i've already given you a glimpse as to the necessary qualities you require to win against such elite grandmasters you need good knowledge of the openings you play you need sound understanding of the positions that you get after the opening you need to be tactically alert and not shy away from sacrificing material if there is a necessity and you have to build over the momentum and remember to continuously keep asking questions about how you can improve your pieces and utilize uh, your uh, uh, forces in any given position that's all from my side i hope you like the video do hit the like button do subscribe to our channel i'll be back with another video soon until then take care and bye bye